solution to our problem government is the problem black men think Stanley Levy thinking. black man thinking here thinking. on the dominant force in internet and servitism talk america radio dot us also wddq talk 92.1 fm in valdosta georgia wjhc talk 107.5 fm in north florida freedom in america radio dot com and wlbb news talk am 1330 in Carrollton, Georgia. Happy to be with you. And let's start with the economy. Because nobody seems to be talking about it. I find that odd. There is reporting on the economy. None of it is bad. We went through a lot of bad reporting on the economy during the Obama administration, and that was even after the recession had been put to bed for some time. We're not getting bad economic reporting during these early months of the Trump administration. As a matter of fact, the New York Times reported that the U.S. trade deficit shrank in August as exports rose. Exports are rising? That implies that maybe there's a manufacturing uptick or something like that. Well, Rising exports and falling imports shrank the U.S. trade deficit in goods and service to the lowest level in nearly a year. That was data released by the Commerce Commerce Department back on October 5th. The trade deficit, the gap between what the United States imports and what it exports, narrowed to $42.4 billion in August, down $1.2 billion from July. So we're reversing the trend because when you think about it the idea that the United States which has the largest economy which means it probably builds more than anyone else would not be in a trade surplus situation is kind of interesting but now it seems like that is going down there are other reports that indicate pretty much the same thing Uh, In July, the U.S. trade deficit was down. In June, uh, Forbes reported that. In September, CNBC reported that the trade deficit was down to $43.7 billion versus an estimate of $44.7 billion. So it would definitely seem as though the manufacturing segment of the economy is getting its feet back up under it and starting to make a case for American goods abroad. I'd say that's a good thing. On the jobs front, we had a recent jobs report where we had a loss. We had a report that there were 33,000 jobs lost. In the month of September, 
Now, what one could say, and it is appropriate, that September was a tough month for, say, the Gulf Coast because of Hurricane Harvey. It was also a rough month uh, for the state of Florida because of Hurricane um, Irma. And September also had some effects on Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. But Bloomberg came back out on the 6th of October and gave this explanation for the jobs report. Down 33,000, a loss of 33,000 jobs during last month. However, the household survey, the jobless rate ticking down to 4.2 percent and the average hourly earnings month over month climbing a half of one percent, better than the three tenths of percent estimated year over year earnings rising 2.9 percent. Now, let's bring it break it down a little bit here uh, because we're looking at a difference in surveys, right? On the one hand, you have the payroll survey and that loss of 33,000, which reflects folks who did not get paid during the week. However, the household survey, which reflects that jobless rate of 4.2 percent, uh, reflects people who had a job even if they didn't get paid during the week. And there one, were one and a half million people who did have a job but did not go to work for the entire week because of the hurricanes that we talked about. So as part of that jobless rate, the number of unemployed persons fell by 331,000 to 6.8 million. The jobless rate of 4.2 percent is the lowest since February of 2001. Food services and drinking places saw a decrease in payrolls of 105,000. Again, the effect of the hurricane, the biggest increases in jobs uh, during the month, transportation and warehousing, as well as health care. Let's make sure we understand. The reason that the government is reporting that there were 33,000 fewer jobs in the month of September is not because people lost jobs. They were on jobs, still employed, but were not paid. And the reason that they were not paid was because the businesses that pay them were disrupted, not ended, not closed, simply disrupted for a time by the hurricane. But here's the other thing that is interesting. From the same report, this is Bloomberg, this is the uh, article that they published, Americans are coming off the labor market sidelines at a pace that intensified in September. The number of people going from out of the labor market into jobs jumped to an all-time high last month, the Bureau of Labor Statistics Employment Report showed on Friday, even as the number of people flowing into unemployment fell. While these numbers can be volatile, they provide the latest confirmation that Americans are being pulled into work as the labor market tightens. That's the thing that Barack Obama said well, these jobs, they're gone and they're never coming back. He and Vice President Joe Biden said the same thing. But here we are nine months, less than nine months, into the Trump administration and people are coming back into the workforce. Unemployment is at an all-time low, at least over the last decade, 15 plus years. And that is despite the fact that we are seeing what people want to call full employment based on the U3 unemployment rate, which now stands at 4.2%. Folks, the numbers have been cooked for so long. And if you understand that there are six different employment rates, of which only one is regularly reported, it's called the headline rate, which is U3. It doesn't even count the people who are on the sidelines. It doesn't. Never did. But the Bureau of Labor Statistics is showing that people are coming out of that, I've given up on the labor market status, I've given up looking for a job. They're not even coming, they're not just coming back to that, to being looking. They're coming straight past that bypassing unemployment line and the unemployment insurance line and going straight into jobs. Do you think that's important? I dare say it's very important. There are some other indicators going on as well. Payday loans. 
are on the decline. This is Bloomberg again. They reported this on the 28th of September. Payday loans are on the decline as the U.S. economy improves. Fewer Americans are taking out short-term high-interest loans. Why? Because they don't need them. Why? Because they're making enough money. Why? Because the economy is getting better and paying people. Payday lending is declining as the U.S. economic expansion matures and Americans' financial situations improve, according to figures from the Federal Reserve Survey of Consumer Finances report released back in late September. The percentage of Americans who said they took out a payday loan in 2016 dropped to 3.4% from 4.2% in 2013. Guys, well that that was all that all happened before Trump. Yeah. But now when people are coming back out of being away from the workforce, back in. Do you think they're coming back in so they can take out payday loans? I doubt it. Well, you're saying the economy was getting better under Obama. I don't know about that. I would say that certain things happened on his watch in that last year. And it may have had a lot to do with the American people understanding that they had a clear choice to make in the November election between a continuation of Barack Obama and what was also on the ballot. That's an indication. Rising interest rates back in March, two months into the Trump administration, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates to three quarters of a percent, a one quarter percent increase. And the reason for that? What was the reason for that? The Fed, ra- the Fed raises rate and sees more hikes as U.S. economy improves. Excuse me, this is the uh, Chicago Tribune, not the New York Times. This was back in March. The Federal Reserve has raised its benchmark interest rate for the second time in three months and signaled that further hikes this year will be gradual. The move reflects a consistently solid U.S. economy and will likely mean higher rates on some consumer and business loans. Oh, it's terrible. Interest rates are going up. Wrong. The reason the rates were down was to try to spur business activity. You need to understand how these things work. The fact that they would raise rates is their way to moderate economic growth so that it doesn't overheat and to help people manage risk by making borrowing money more expensive. Less speculation, more investment. You think that matters? It does. On top of that, there's still the rising GDP growth. Gross domestic product hit a two-year high. This is uh, Business Insider reporting at the end of last month. U.S. economic growth in the second quarter was stronger than previously thought, according to the Commerce Department's third estimate of the GDP released late last month. GDP, the value of everything produced in America, was revised up to an annualized growth rate of 3.1%. And it was revised up from 3.0. It was the fastest rate since the first quarter of 2015. See, see, Barack Obama, Barack Obama never had a year of 3% growth. Granted, this is just a quarter of one quarter of a year of 3% growth. But Donald Trump hasn't even been in office nine months. The boost to growth came from stronger than expected consumer spending, which is usually the biggest contributor to the economy. People are confident as consumers under President Trump. This is not a Trump is wonderful. No, this is just the numbers. Trade set, trade deficit going down. Jobs reports showing people coming out of being out of the workforce and coming back into the workforce and not coming back to connect to collect public assistance in the form of unemployment insurance, but coming back into jobs. 
People are taking out fewer payday loans. Interest rates are going up, which is an indicator of a stronger economy, and GDP is on the rise. But what are we hearing about in the media? We're hearing about that silly mayor of San Juan, Puerto Rico, lying about FEMA. Probably talk about that a little bit more later. The economy is what will all but guarantee a re-election for Donald Trump. Just as it did for Ronald Reagan, the economy and its performance during that first term guaranteed him a landslide of epic proportions. And it can do the same thing for Donald Trump. But no one on the left is really looking to discuss this. And when I say that, that includes the mainstream U.S. press. I'm not seeing this on CNN. I'm not seeing this on ABC, NBC, CBS. I'm not really even seeing it on Fox. I have to go read. I have to go look for this. I have to go do do searches to find out. But the information is out there. It's not being reported. They don't want you to know. You need to ask why that is. Because once you get to the heart of that, you will really have an understanding of what's going on in the real U.S. of A as opposed to butthurt America. The real United States wants to go to work, wants to make things, and wants to produce and get paid and take care of their families. Butthurt America is all about personalities and worrying about who's tweeting and who's being dissed in the tweet and who's taking a knee, all these things that do not matter a hill of beans. And all these people who are finding their way back into the economy and back into employment, I give you three guesses who they're going to support when it comes time to vote for president. And it's not going to be anybody likely whose name is followed by the letter D. Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking. We'll be back right after this. Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking, here on the dominant force in Internet conservatism, TalkAmericaRadio.us, also WDDQ, Talk 92.1 FM in Valdosta, Georgia. WJHC Talk 1075 in North Florida, Freedom in America Radio.com, and WLBB News Talk AM 1330 in Carrollton, Georgia. Now, I talked about this uh, last week, but I'm going to talk about it again, and that's discussing Puerto Rican hurricane relief. And the only reason I'm talking about this, again, is the lies from the current mayor of San Juan, Puerto Rico, Carmen Yulin Cruz continue. Uh, She's out there on Twitter um, within the last day. What do you do when devastation hits you and there's no help on the really? And there's no help on the horizon. We will make it. Power collapses in San Juan Hospital with four patients now being transferred out. Have requested support from FEMA. Nothing. And before that, it looks like she sent a, she sent the same tweet but changed the number of patients out to CNN that there were only two patients being transferred out. Look, this little chica here is a joke. The problem is what she's joking about is extremely serious. She is a political tool, a political operative who is not the least bit interested in doing anything for her people. San Juan Mayor slams Trump administration comments on Puerto Rican hurricane response. We already know what that's about. The gulf between what Trump administration officials in Washington are saying about hurricane recovery and what people in Puerto Rico are seeing on the ground came into sharp view Friday as the mayor stopped. What people? Because the governor is saying nothing but praise for the Trump administration. Other mayors are saying, what people? I hear person. 
I hear person. Now, why don't we get into some truth about Puerto Rico and hurricanes, shall we? Why don't we do that? Because the issue on the island, when you really get down to it, KTLA 5, um, on the 27th of September, vital aid stranded at Puerto Rico's main port, unable to move due to ravaged infrastructure. What does the president have to do with that? The aid is there. That's what they're telling you. A mountain of food, water, and other vital supplies has arrived in Puerto Rico's main port of San Juan, but a shortage of truck a shortage of truckers stop. A shortage of truckers? What the heck does that mean? And the island's devastated infrastructure are making it tough to move aid where it's needed most. Only 20%, one in five, of truck drivers have reported back to work since Hurricane Maria swept through, according to a spokesman for Puerto Rico's governor, Ricardo Rosselló. Only 20% of truck drivers. So are you trying to say that 80% of Puerto Rico's truck drivers are dead? Are you trying to say that 80% of uh, the truck drivers in Puerto Rico don't have working cell phones? I don't have I have a problem with that because when you saw President Trump in the refugee center or the aid centers in Puerto Rico, everybody and their dog had a cell phone. They were taking selfies with him, they were taking videos of him. Everybody had a cell phone. No truckers have cell phones. Why I find that difficult to believe. We can't reach them, says the governor. When we say that we don't have truck drivers, we mean that we have not been able to contact them, Rossello said. Shipping co- companies have aid and supplies either waiting at the port to be delivered or held up at ports in the mainland United States because you have so much stuff sitting in ports in Puerto Rico that cannot be delivered. Shipping company Crowley is one of them. It has 3,000 containers at the port of San Juan filled with clue, excuse me, with clothes, food, medicine, water, construction materials, and even cars. So what is this little chica Carmen Yulín Cruz talking about? David Bernieau, a reporter, on the 30th of September confirmed with his own eyes what I just read from that KTLA report. This is unbelievable. So we're at the port here in San Juan, and we wanted to see where's the food, the supplies, everything that's needed. We got here, and here's what we were told. There are more than 3,000 shipping containers here at the port which are just sitting here. It's got everything they need. I literally said to somebody, what's on there? And they said, whatever you need, emergency supplies, anything that a a grocery store would need. But it's just sitting here. The reason why? People aren't showing up to pick it up. The people who run the port say we've got guys in line ready to put these on a truck, but nobody's showing up. The governor of Puerto Rico says they're having trouble reaching the truck drivers. Maybe maybe their homes are destroyed. Wait a minute. You can't reach the truck drivers, but there are people at the ports who made it there who are able to load stuff on. How ridiculous does this sound? The people who work at the ports were able to get out of their devastated homes and travel over the devastated infrastructure to get to the ports and be ready to load stuff onto trucks so it can be carried as far as the trucks can move. You could reach them. They showed up for work, but you can't reach four out of five truck drivers. Are you serious? There have been reports that there was a truck driver's strike over pay. There's a report on that now. Snopes.com and a whole lot of other people in media tend to be tending to be somewhat left leaning or go are working overtime. And of course the Teamsters are working overtime to say, oh no, there was no strike. That's not what's going on. You know, I, I, I would argue that the people who work the ports are probably unionized as well and they're at work. They can be reached. 
80% can't be reached as of the beginning of the month. 3,000 shipping containers with clothes, food, medicine, water, construction material, cars are sitting. So the aid is there. Where are the truckers? Now, interestingly, because this story won't die, and when I say the story won't die, it's the lie that there's some issue with what the administration has been doing. That won't die. So the administration put out a response. They put out a time a timeline. Are you, are you hearing me? They're pretty, they put out a timeline. Sarah Huckabee Sanders, press secretary, put out a timeline that showed that the administration and FEMA were involved in getting ready to deal with this disaster at least three days before, three days before the hurricane hit, three days. And on the 21st, the day after, you had two FEMA urban search and rescue teams in Puerto Rico and 1,500 federal staff in both Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. On the 22nd, two days afterward, you had aid on the way. I'm not exactly sure how you want someone to respond when they start gearing up before the trouble even hits. They did more to prepare to recover Puerto Rico and San Juan from this hurricane than the mayor of San Juan, Puerto Rico, did to prepare that city for the disaster. It's ridiculous. But she's still tweeting. She's still lying. And because she is a female person of color, she is being given credence by the press. That's all there is to this. By the way, who is is it who who is standing up for this woman? Who is agreeing with her? Anybody? There is another mayor in Puerto Rico in Puerto Rico. His name is Angel Perez, Angel Perez Otero. You want to know what he has to say about Trump? He says Trump's been great. Trump has been great. And he criticized the mayor of San Juan. She's not even showing up to the FEMA meetings. Where are you? Trump has been great. San Juan's mayor. San Juan's mayor has been AWOL. The mayor of Gainabo, Puerto Rico, criticized neighboring San Juan mayor Carmen Yulín Cruz for playing politics after Hurricane Maria. He also praised President Trump for his hurricane recovery coordination efforts. Said, uh, the mayor, uh, Angel Perez Otero, says that Yulín Cruz has been a no-show at coordinating meetings between FEMA, the military officials, and Puerto Rican leaders. He says he's been in constant contact with U.S. officials and is confident they will provide the very best recovery efforts they can. We are receiving, is a direct quote, his, we are receiving a lot of help from FEMA and the Red Cross. There is lots of help coming to us. They won't leave until Puerto Rico is good. So why is this woman out here lying? And she's messing herself up with FEMA, the very people who are out there to help you. This is what the FEMA chief had to say in an interview about her on the 30th of September. 
says that there is such poor leadership ability by the mayor of San Juan and others in Puerto Rico. You've seen the mayor make her personal pleas uh, on our air uh, about what is needed. We've seen pictures of her actually assisting people firsthand. The president even said they want everything to be done for them when it should be a community effort. Surely you have heard from people in Puerto Rico who you've had direct lines of communication with. And what are they feeling when they hear the president's sentiments like this? First of all, um, so we have great communication with Governor Rosselló, and I know that the president has spoken with him today. The vice president was with us as well. Not only Governor Rosselló, but Governor Mapp and the Virgin Islands, uh, they, were, they were hit pretty hard as well. Mm -hmm. um, bottom line is, is we have great communication. Uh, the governors are part of our unified command effort. Uh, mm -hmm. The problem that we have with the mayor, unfortunately, is, is that unity of command is what is needed to be, re is, is, is ultimately what's needed to be successful in this response. Uh, the bottom line is, is we've had a joint field office established for numerous days in San Juan, and what we need is for um, the mayor, the good mayor, to uh, make her way to the joint field office and get plugged into what's going on and be successful. So I think that's the, uh, the bottom line on that tweet. He's trying to get something done. She's not even there to see what's going on. He went on to say that she is just making political noise. Are you figuring this one out yet? What we have is a woman who is a political tool of the progressive left who is trying to smear this particular president. And the interesting thing is that the evidence that she's lying is sitting in the port of San Juan the evidence that she is lying is being put out there by the governor of Puerto Rico. The evidence that she is lying is being echoed by other mayors on the island. It's fascinating. And by the way, Daily Wire reported on October 1st, she admits, the San Juan mayor admits she hasn't met with federal officials at Joint Field Office over hurricane relief efforts. San Juan Mayor Carmen Yulín Cruz, a Democrat, went on a tirade on Saturday accusing President Trump of allowing Puerto Ricans to die because he just doesn't care. But now it turns out Cruz is not in the loop and hasn't even bothered to participate in meetings with officials from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, or other federal, uh, federal agencies. This angers me. Not because she's attacking Donald Trump. This angers me because she is basically dissing the entire nation of Americans who care and have someone acting on their behalf who is not the president. FEMA is not the president. They are there. They got there as soon as they could. After the hurricane moved on, they moved in. They've been talking with the governor. They've been talking with other mayors. They're holding meetings. They're coordinating what they can. Aid is sitting in the ports. And this chick can't be, you need a milk carton panel to find this woman. Unless you put a camera on her so she can wear a t-shirt. This is a problem. It is a major problem. It can't last because it is such a bald-faced lie. The major problem is the boldness of progressives to put out and continue a false narrative. That is the danger. You've gotten to the point where they are lying without conscience. You have great people in Puerto Rico. Now, the whole thing, there's also that narrative, well, you know, he's not going to do anything for Puerto Rico because Puerto Rico is a bunch of brown people. Puerto Rico is 75% white folk, guys. 74.8. White folks. And guess what? The people that were helped by FEMA and Trump in Texas, in Florida, in Louisiana, nobody was saying anything about... Maybe some of you don't remember, there was a couple of black women that he spoke with at one of the refugee centers in Houston, and one of them, after talking to him face to face, came away with a, an opinion of him that did not match her original view. She had thought negatively of him before she met him, and after meeting with him and talking with him, said, quote, I think he's a wonderful man, and she's black. 
So who do you think she's going to remember come 2020? I hope that people are beginning to wake up to the fact that the left is evil in their efforts to destroy this particular administration. They're not even after Donald Trump. I've said this over and over again. Donald Trump is not their target. You are. They want to demean you by criticizing Donald Trump. If you put up with it, then it's more than a problem. If you continue to turn Democrats out of office and then tune them out, which is the last and most important step, once you get rid of people for demonstrating that they do not care about your country, why are you listening to them anymore? Turn them out. Tune them out. Make America great again. It's pretty simple for me. Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking. We'll be back right after this. Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking, here on the dominant force of Internet Conservatism, TalkAmericaRadio.us. Also, WDDQ, Talk 92.1 FM in Valdosta, Georgia. WJHC, Talk 107.5 North Florida Talk Radio, Freedom in America. Dot com and WLBB News Talk AM 1330 in Carrollton, Georgia. Well, let's discuss Donald Trump's version of pen and phone on Obamacare. You may recall that when things were no longer going Barack Obama's way in the House and Senate, he made this statement. I'm going to be working with Congress where I can to accomplish this, but I'm also going to act on my own. Uh, if uh, Congress is deadlocked. I've got a pen to take executive actions where Congress won't, and I've got a telephone to rally folks around the country uh, on this mission. Basically, I'm going to do whatever I want to do, and uh doesn't matter what you guys think. What that little clip overlooks, as well as the President's other remarks on the subject, was that the reason he was reduced to pen and phone instead of relying on it, on legislation such as Obamacare and Dodd-Frank was because after less than two years into his administration, the American people had said, this is not what we want, and they took the majorities from the Democrat Party. Obama had, had strong majorities in the House and Senate when he took office in 2009. By the 2010 midterms, the American people had said, you need adult supervision, and they took those majorities away. Did that even chasten in the slightest Barack Obama? No. Well, I'll just ignore Congress. The whole problem with ignoring Congress is you're ignoring the American people, which was the hallmark of the Obama administration ignoring the American people. Well, in fulfilling a campaign promise, Donald Trump accomplished the following the same day he was inaugurated. The first executive order of Donald Trump's presidency followed through on one of his main campaign promises, minimizing the Affordable Care Act. The order tells government agencies to waive, defer, grant exemptions from, or delay the implementation of any part of the act they can while still following the law. It's tough to tell exactly how much effect the order will have, but it's a clear signal the Trump administration wants the current version of Obamacare off the books as soon as possible. Republicans want the ACA repealed because they say it's ineffective and that its costs are too restrictive on business. Democrats argue while it isn't perfect, millions depend on it for care they wouldn't be able to get otherwise. House Majority Leader Paul Ryan has said the law won't be fully repealed without a suitable replacement. Interesting thing about that, because that was, of course, back in January of 2017. Very different political environment then as opposed to now. And Paul Ryan doing his normal rhino routine saying, oh, well, we're not going to repeal it without a replacement when that is not what the people voted for for seven years. They did not vote for looking for a replacement. They voted 
the Republican Party into the majority and kept them there because of the promise, at least in part, that they would repeal Obamacare and they have failed. It is understandable why they failed beforehand. They did not have the votes to override a Barack Obama veto. Now they have been exposed. There is no veto threat to a repeal bill, but they can't produce one. But notice what it said. Follow the law, just to, just just obstruct anything that would put a burden on any individual or any group and still follow the law. Why is that? Because though the law is a couple thousand pages, the regulations to implement it are in the tens of thousands. And it's easy to follow the law without putting a burden on people. Because there's a reason why you needed those tens of thousands of pages of regulations. Just ignore them. You can. Regulations are not law. Now, not surprisingly, when Donald Trump did this, and you're still dealing with the shock and awe of his win and all the, I think you might have remembered the whole push by Hollywood to have the people who were electors, just disregard who sent them there to do what they were supposed to do, and you just can't vote for Trump. So you have all this early anti-Trump. You had the um, demonstrations, riots, and upheavals in the street. You had all these against this backdrop when Donald Trump signs this executive order. uh, The Sunday following, here is our good friend Chuck Schumer, declaring it meaningless. Let's turn to health care. President Trump signed an executive order on Friday that he said would have the effect of easing the burden of Obamacare. What's your understanding of what this executive order will mean? Well, let me first say this. They are in such they are in such a pro- they have so many problems with their repeal and replace. Uh, it's interesting. If you would have told me that at this point in time, Democrats would be united and on offense and Republicans would be divided on defense when it comes to ACA or the cabinet for that matter. Uh, I would have said, you know, you're wrong, but it's true. And we've had a very strong two weeks um, because they're in such a pickle. Uh, They don't know what to do. Um, They can repeal, but they don't have any plan for replace. And the president's executive order just mirrored that. They said, do good things, not bad things, and do things that um, that comply with the law. That's meaningless. And uh, it's because they promised everybody they were going to repeal. But now they've seen all the good things in ACA, the 20 million people covered, uh, pre-existing conditions covered, kids 21 to 26 get their parents' health, uh, health insurance, uh, women treated equally as men. And they know that to repeal these things without finding a way to do them, to undo them, uh, would be catastrophic, uh, substantively and politically. So they're in a total pickle. And this regulation uh, does really nothing. It does really nothing. So why are you spending so much time talking about something that does nothing? And again, the mentioning of replacement, which is not what the people of the United States voted for when they voted for the Republican Party against or in place of the Democrat Party to put them in control of the House and later the Senate. No one was talking about replacement. They were talking about repeal. And that was a winning message. Also, on that second day after Donald Trump signed that executive order, knowing that it was going to make waves, uh, he knew, he did know, Kellyanne Conway, who was still uh, much more involved with the White House than she seems to be currently, at least as a spokesman and as a communicator, etc., so on, went on Face the Nation and had these statements and comments. Let me ask you what he's actually done. Obviously, there's some dispute about, the, uh, about whether there was an uplifting speech, but I want to ask you about what he's actually done that affects real, real Americans. Uh, he took an executive action on the Affordable Care Act. If, for the 20 million or so who get their insurance that way, what's that going to mean to them? Well, for the 20 million who rely upon the Affordable Care Act in some form, they will not be without coverage during this transition time. But, John, let's talk about the millions who have already lost their health care, lost their insurance plans, lost their doctors. That devastation has been terrible for many Americans and their families. And what he wants to do in replacing 
Obamacare with a more patient-centric free market solution mm -hmm. is to make sure these people have coverage. Uh, lots of but, folks got caught in that in that trap and that gap, and he wants to make sure that through his plan you well, can buy insurance across state lines, you have a health savings account, you block grant Medicaid to the states. Let me ask you this, Kelly. Uh, well, a couple first things. One, uh, the number of health insurance, according to Gallup, uh, only 11 percent is uh, uninsured in America. That's the lowest in the last eight years. Is that the standard for Donald Trump's health reforms, that anybody anywhere who loses their health insurance, that that's, that will be seen as a failure of his health insurance plan? And well, I still don't know if I'm on the Affordable Care Act, what the what that executive order, the action he's now taken, should people be, what should they think? Well, they should think that it's a great big step toward replacing Obamacare with a plan that works for more Americans, that truly makes it affordable and accessible. Uh, you know, there are other Americans, it, baked in your statistic there, John, who can't use their health care because their premiums have skyrocketed so dramatically in places like Arizona by 113 percent, in Pennsylvania, 53 percent. And so people who actually count as having health care actually can't access it because they can't afford the premiums okay. and the deductible. So okay. we want to make it easier for them. We hear from small right. business owners and families Let every me, single day that this is a crushing burden uh, for them. I find it just fascinating how John Dickerson, who's supposed to be an anchor and conducting an interview, is constantly on the verge of interrupting. Uh, but can I? What? Amazing. She defended very well in that sound bite, because that's all it is really a, a sound bite what the executive order did. Most people who oppose Donald Trump's executive orders have not read them. And those who have read them choose to excerpt them in the most negative way possible. That's political opposition. But that's not policy opposition. The truth of the matter is he's saying it's a bad law and we should do everything we can to undermine this bad law without breaking it because we are the federal government and the executive branch of that federal government is supposed to enforce the law. I can enforce the law, but I can still undermine it without breaking it. And that's what the president has said he's going to do. Now, more recently, the president has said that he is going to sign an executive order rolling back health regulations. This is being reported by The Hill. President Trump will sign an executive order on the week of the 8th of October aimed at rolling back health insurance regulations put in place by former President Obama in an effort to undo his predecessor's signature health care law. Notice what it says. I'm going to get rid of the regulations. The regulations are not law. They're not part of the law. The order will direct the Departments of Health and Human Services, Labor, and Treasury to make it easier for individuals to group together and purchase insurance through association health plans, according to the report. In other words, you don't need the government to get a break from insurance companies. You simply need a group. The president also directs the agencies in order to roll back the Obama administration's regulations of short-term medical insurance, which is a cheap, limited protection option that the former administration claimed did not provide adequate coverage for individuals. So I'm going to write you an executive order that says the stuff that doesn't work, we're getting rid of that. The regulation requiring insurance plans to cover a set package of benefits will also be rolled back. You have no big idea how big that is. Instead of telling people that you have a one-size-fits-all minimum package, we will allow insurance companies to design packages that fit customers, which basically means people can buy what they need and avoid what they don't. We never had a need for a 27-year-old male to be covered for pregnancy. We never had a need for a post-menopausal female to be covered for lactation. This was always nonsense and just a way to extract money to redistribute income and wealth. So the truth of the matter is that a lack of restrictive regulations and inertia will kill Obamacare anyway. It'll, the problem is it'll still be on the books. So that means when the next progressive or more progressive pe president comes into office, they can put back all these regulations that Donald Trump is getting rid of and make this a stranglehold on the, um, on the American people once again. That is why Donald Trump wants legislation. 
He can hack this thing to pieces through executive order, and everybody knows it. But as soon as he's out of office, if the next one is not like him or more right-leaning than he, then this thing can come back with a vengeance. He wants to stop that. I think he's correct to want to stop that. But he's used his pen and phone the same way Barack Obama said he was going to use it. He's simply being more effective. He is disrupting the Democrat Party. Well, he's trying to deal with them. You know, here's the interesting thing about being a deal maker when you have more than one group with which you can deal. You play them one against the other. Donald Trump goes and talks to the Democrats after the Republicans fail. What does that do to the Republicans? Do they give up or do they now need to go back and figure out how they're going to get something done? Well, they're scheduling a vote again, aren't they? Toward that end, Donald Trump had the following to say about the new executive order that he was thinking of signing. We're also going to meet with Democrats, and I will see if I can get a health care plan that's even better. So I will negotiate with Democrats, but from the Republican standpoint, we have the vote. We'll vote in January, February, or March. What about executive order? Are you considering an executive order? I am considering an executive order on associations, and that will take care of a tremendous number of people with regard to health care. And I'll probably be signing a very major executive order where people can go out, cross state lines, do lots of things, and buy their own health care. And that will be probably signed next week. It's being finished now. It's going to cover a lot of territory and a lot of people, millions of people. Yes, John, go ahead. Uh, I think we're there now, John. I'll be honest. You look at the uh, statement put out by Alaska, by right? You saw that, by Lisa. Uh, you look at the other couple of statements. You know, we're only, we're only one off. Maybe two. But we can't vote now, John. You probably didn't hear me because, as you know, one of our yes votes is in the hospital. I can't take, I can't wait. I can't take him out of the hospital. And he was referring to uh, Senator Thad Cochran of Mississippi, who is recuperating not in a hospital, but at home. But you get the drift. Pin and phone. And he is chopping down the Obamacare tree. I'm going to turn this over to my good friend Ron Edwards, and after that, we'll be back with Hour 2 of Black Man Thinking. The lunacy of the loopy left must be taken seriously and beaten back, or else... Hello, I'm Ron Edwards. On today's page from the Edwards Notebook, ideas ranging from the progressive income tax, overregulation, slavery, Hitler's horrors... The destruction of the God-ordained traditional family bigotry against Christianity and the American Constitution, just to name a few, have left their horrendous mark on society. As time marches on, it is abundantly clear that unless the profoundly asinine efforts of those of the loony left are not soon overcome, we may witness the onslaught of a new dark age of gloomy existence where our unalienable rights which come from God will be squashed under the boot heel of those seeking to kill liberty, steal our national wealth, and destroy our national foundational Judeo-Christian heritage. And speaking of lunacy, Professor James Dwyer and William and Mary, whose influence has poisoned New York's family court system, has stated that parenthood is not a biological reality, not a fundamental part of being human, but is only a creation of the state, and that the state confers legal parenthood on people through its parental and maternity laws. Hmm. To that, I say bunk. What say you? I'm Ron Edwards. Sponsored by the Tri-County Liberty Coalition. I have a dream. One day, this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created in Black men think and think and Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, 
defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. Black men thinking. Anytime you throw your weight behind a political party that controls two-thirds of the government, and that party can't keep the promise that it made to you during election time, and you are dumb enough to walk around continuing to identify yourself with that party, you're not only a chump, but you're a traitor to your race. Black men thinking. If we lose freedom here, there's no place to escape to. This is the last stand on earth. And this idea that government is beholden to the people, that it has no other source of power except the sovereign people, is still the newest and the most unique idea in all the long history of man's relation to man. Whether we believe in our capacity for self-government or whether we abandon the American Revolution and confess that a little intellectual elite in a far distant capital can plan our lives for us better than we can plan them ourselves. Black men thinking, thinking, thinking. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. Black men thinking, Stanley, thinking, Black men thinking here thinking. on the dominant force of the internet conservative. TalkAmericaRadio.us, also WDDQ, Talk 92.1 FM in Valdosta, Georgia, WJHC, Talk 107.5, North Florida Talk Radio, FreedomInAmericaRadio.com, and WLBB News Talk AM 1330 in Carrollton, Georgia. Well, to open up Hour 2 of the show, let's just talk about how everybody loves Harvey being Weinstein until now. This, as a result of, I'm really not even sure what to make of this, except that liberal orthodoxy is having a hard time holding together because Harvey Weinstein's been, he's been what he is for decades. And it has been described as an open secret. Why everyone is now turning on the man to whom they turned a blind eye regarding his escapades and antics, I don't know. But this much has been reported. The new headline tonight involving one of the most powerful figures in Hollywood. Several allegations of sexual harassment against movie producer Harvey Weinstein. From young assistants to a famous actress. And tonight here, his response. Here's ABC's Lindsay Davis now. Explosive new allegations tonight from the New York Times about Harvey Weinstein, the studio exec known for producing blockbuster movies like Goodwill Hunting, Pulp Fiction, and Silver Linings Playbook. Because I am so much crazier than you. He's been lauded repeatedly by male and female Oscar winners alike. Harvey Weinstein, who believed in us and made this movie. My friends at Miramax for making this film, especially Harvey. Now Weinstein says he's planning to take a leave of absence to deal with the issue head on. The New York Times describes several sexual harassment accusations, including from actress Ashley Judd, who told Variety back in 2015, I was sexually harassed by one of our industry's most famous admired slash reviled bosses. She did not name him at the time, but Variety describes how he kept summoning her to his hotel room under the pretense of talking about roles in his movies and tried to get Judd to watch him take a shower. According to the New York Times, Weinstein reached settlements with at least eight women. In response to the allegations, Weinstein said in a statement, I came of age in the 60s and 70s when all the rules about behavior in workplaces were different. I appreciate the way I've behaved with colleagues in the past has caused a lot of pain, and I sincerely apologize for it. Attorney Lisa Bloom, daughter of feminist lawyer Gloria Allred, is advising Weinstein and released a statement calling him an old dinosaur learning new ways, but also says he denies many of the accusations as patently false. Weinstein's lawyer tells ABC News they plan to sue the New York Times, saying the story is saturated with false and defamatory statements. The New York Times says they are confident in their reporting. David? Lindy Davis. So the liberal paper of record is not backing down from a very powerful liberal. Interesting. You're going to sue us? Bring it. We, we got something for that. Do you remember that Ashley Judd was there during the so-called Women's March, whatever they had uh, in response to Trump's inauguration, standing up to him about the things he said about women back in 2005? But she's afraid of Harvey Weinstein, wouldn't even call him by name. She's not a feminist, she's a coward. She's the worst kind of coward. She will sell her soul 
for an opportunity to make money. And she has demonstrated it. Donald Trump's not about to pay her. So he's fair game. But Harvey Weinstein can call her up repeatedly to his hotel room and have her watch him take showers. But she has nothing to say about it. Really? And that has been the story of late, the hypocrisy. This is the same Hollywood crowd that went whole ham, went ham on Bill Cosby for what he did for decades, and it's dirty, and it's wrong, and it's this. Okay, what about this guy again? And is this the, for, see, those of us who are actually really awake, not the woke folk, but the really awake people, we know how racist progressives are. We know that Bill Cosby got shafted while Bill Clinton, who's been raping people since the 1960s, and Harvey Weinstein, who basically admitted that he's been doing pretty much the same. And Bill Clinton is still getting a pass. And Harvey Weinstein's not going to lose much money. He's already paid out eight paid out eight settlements. He's been paying. But Trump is the problem. Well, but Trump can mess up the whole co- This guy is dealing with your money. He's controlling your careers. Donald Trump's not doing that. No president is doing that. But you're out to get Donald Trump. But Harvey Weinstein Weinstein can do pretty much whatever he pleases. Speaking of hypocrisy, this is something that struck me as very interesting, I and I admit it, because I am not an Obama fan. I think they are as crooked as the day is long. And here's a couple of pieces, just snippets. This is from 2013, where Michelle Obama does something pretty interesting in speaking about Harvey Weinstein. I want to start by thanking Harvey Weinstein for organizing this Amazing day. Harvey. This is possible because of Harvey. Uh, He is a wonderful human being, a good friend, and uh, just a powerhouse. And the fact that he and his team took the time to make this happen. A good friend and a wonderful human being. That's back in 2013, and I can hear the apologist now. Well, she probably didn't know what he was like back in 2013. and, and uh, Okay. But they let him come and stay in the White House. They didn't find out anything about him. More importantly, five years later, or four years later, excuse me, you learn about this regarding the Obamas and Harvey Weinstein. Breaking news as former President Obama and his wife Michelle head to Palm Springs to reset from the last eight years. ET Online is reporting that the Obama's 18-year-old daughter, Malia, is headed to Hollywood. A source has revealed to ET that Malia will be interning under producer Harvey Weinstein. Malia has been taking some time off since graduating from high school in 2016. Weinstein Company is run by brothers Harvey and Bob Weinstein and is well known for its acclaimed films, including Oscar winner The King's Speech and The Artist, the 2017's Oscar contender, Lion. Let's make sure we get this straight. Four years ago in 2013, Michelle Obama stood on the stage and praised Harvey Weinstein, calling him a good friend and a wonderful human being. Four years later, they take their minor daughter, Well, 18, she's not a minor. They send their daughter off to intern with someone they know is a sexual pervert. I'm not even entertaining anyone who's trying to tell me that they are so ignorant that they do not know what that man is. It was an open secret in Hollywood, one of the most open secrets in Hollywood. Everyone knew who and what he was. And no president had his nose further up the Hollywood behind than Barack Hussein Obama. He knew what he was, and he sent his daughter to intern with him. Stop me if you've heard about child abuse before. 
Oh, but she's not a child anymore. She's uh Oh, and she wanted to go. What makes someone want to intern with a sexual predator? And what parent in their right mind doesn't do everything they can to stay in the way, to stand in the way and stop that type of behavior? But they did not. They did not. What this tells me, because you can find all the pictures of the Clintons and the Weinsteins. You can find all the pictures that you want of Weinstein hobnobbing with name your high-powered liberal. But what you don't find are many people willing to speak. They're afraid of him. So let's make this clear. Progressives are cowards. They're all cowards. And they have no values. Can we be clear about this? Because all of Hollywood knows what he is, knows what he's done, and they had nothing to say, and no one would speak out. And Ashley Judd is a hypocritical nincompoop. She has no credibility, she has no character, she has no value, she has no morals, she has nothing but a pretty face. Interestingly, in trying to get ahead of this thing, the good Mr. Weinstein reached out to Lisa Bloom, daughter of Gloria Allred, who, until she took this case, Ms. Bloom was a fierce advocate for women um, who were accusing people of sexual harassment. I think she may have blown that gig. And she signed up for a very brief period of time as his advisor. Not going to say she was representing him as a, as his attorney. But she signed up as his advisor. And she gave this statement on taking that role. You know, I do a lot of sexual harassment cases, 95% of the time on the side of the accuser. I'm fighting another one of those on Monday. And I've often thought, gee, I wish I could just get into the other side and smack this guy around a little bit and tell him to knock it off and tell him how this is very damaging. Uh, Remarkably, I now have an opportunity to do that. I was very surprised that he admitted to being stupid, uh, to saying things that he shouldn't have said. And I told him, you know, that needs to be your approach. You, You can't go back and change what's happened in the past, but you can go forward and acknowledge it ask for forgiveness, change your behavior, and I thought I had a chance to make a difference here on the other side. Uh, We'll see if if I've done that right. He wanted to be respectful to women, and he still wants to be respectful to women. And he's asked me, of all people, to help guide him in that direction, to explain to him uh, the laws of sexual harassment and why this is important. And by the way, you know, sexual harassment is a legal term that has a particular meaning. The conduct has to rise to a certain level. He does not admit to sexual harassment. What he does admit to is misconduct. I salute any woman who comes forward with complaints of sexual harassment. You know, Harvey has had to learn. This is not an easy time for him either. Uh, probably nobody has sympathy for him right now, and that's fine. But this is a guy who has thrown away the old playbook of Let's attack the women. Let's dig up dirt on their past. Let's humiliate them. Let's fight. He's not doing any of that. He's saying, I need to show respect. Judge me by my actions. I'm sorry. I acknowledge I hurt people. But he's also saying some of the allegations in that New York Times piece were incorrect. Uh, Some of the allegations, which I have read, are he told me I had a nice dress on. He told me I looked cute without my glasses. Uh, Probably he shouldn't be saying things like that in the workplace. Does that rise to the level of sexual harassment legally? No, it doesn't. Any sexual harassment attorney will tell you that. Other allegations are more serious, but there were people in the room who have a different perspective on what happened. And the New York Times did not report their accounts. I don't even know where to start with that twisted, tortured statement. Except to say she's no longer advising him. I think it lasted like a day and a half. So let me get this straight. Somebody who's related to Gloria Allred and represents women who accuse people of sexual harassment. I know she's heard some interesting stories. But dealing with this guy 
was so beyond the pale that she couldn't stay attached. That's not the only person who's stepped in and then stepped away. Deadline Hollywood. Harvey Weinstein loses another key advisor as Lanny Davis resigns. Davis was part of the legal team Weinstein had assembled as he was preparing to face news reports to deal with his long history of sexual harassment. Davis joins another attorney who was advising the mogul on the matter, Lisa Bloom, who announced her resignation. (laughs) Wow. On October 7th. A longtime Democrat Party operative, Davis was a frequent advisor for Bill Clinton on cable news during the Monica Lewinsky scandal and the subsequent impeachment effort against the 42nd president. Officially, Davis was a special counsel to Weinstein uh, pal Clinton from 96 to 98. Stop right there. Lanny Davis has known the serial rapist Bill Clinton and represented him as special counsel. But he, now he could hang in with that guy who's got five decades of dirt. But he couldn't hang in here with Harvey Weinstein. Does that give you an idea of how jacked up this guy is? But she didn't go after Bill Clinton. Well, they impeached him. It didn't do Diddly or his brother squat to him. He still served out his term. Didn't make a bit of difference. But he couldn't handle Harvey Weinstein. And all the liberals and progressives are still too scared. Saturday Night Live didn't even touch it. Had this been something about, about Donald Trump, That's all you would have seen. You would have seen 90 minutes of Saturday Night Live, or however long the show goes, of nothing but skits on Donald Trump and his sexual harassment history. They didn't touch this guy. You want to know why? Because they're cowards, and they fear him. Remarkable. Mark this very carefully. Progressives and liberals have exposed their character or lack thereof and it's all going to come out in the case of Harvey Weinstein Stanley Levy Black Man Thinking will be back right after this Stanley Levy Black Man Thinking here on the dominant force of internet conservatism Talk America Radio. US. Also, WDDQ Talk 92.1 FM in Valdosta, Georgia. WJHC Talk 107.5 FM in North Florida. Freedom in America Radio. Com and WLBB News Talk AM 13:30 in Carrollton, Georgia. Well, progressives are continuing their effort in America to kill competition and also to target the American ethic for either change or elimination. What am I talking about? Well, this was a news story that was reported on a local television station back in 2013. New this morning, it's a long-time tradition in many high school graduations, honoring the top students in the graduating class as valedictorian and salutatorian. But one large Susquehanna Valley High School has now decided to do away with that tradition, No more valedictorian. Instead, they'll be honoring a larger group of top students. Last year's graduation ceremony for Wilson High School in Berks County included all the pomp and circumstance you'd expect to see. But one part of the program won't be around much longer. It is next my esteemed honor to introduce to you the class of 2012 valedictorian Anadita Bandiopadai. Starting with the class of 2017, Wilson High will no longer name a valedictorian or salutatorian. It's a major change in tradition, one the school officials say started with the changing nature of high school education, from summer and college classes to online learning. The conversation as we were going in multiple areas, looking at that that blended environment, um, took us uh, also into a conversation about 
how do we recognize student performance? The battle for the top spot can be intense at times, to the point it can be a distraction for high-performing students. When our students are competing for spots at, at the top colleges, they're, they're not competing against one another. They're competing against students in other high schools across the country. School officials acknowledge some criticism that they're discouraging competition. They will still report and calculate class rank, but instead of valedictorian and salutatorian, there will now be a Latin honor system, which includes honoring all students who achieve a 4.0 grade point average or higher. There were 13 last year. That means soon this group of pictures on a wall at Wilson High, all past valedictorians and salutatorians, will have no new members. I understand valedictorian and salutatorian are strong traditions. Um, and that's what I think forms a lot of the basis for people's opinions and experiences. And that's tough, changing you know, some of those long-held traditions. I now bestow upon you that you are graduates of the Wilson High School. We wanted to build that collaboration of students working with one another here in, in setting them up, and, and our teachers and everybody, setting them, everybody up for success and doing well to compete in the larger world outside of, of Wilson High School. And the new honor system goes into effect with a class of 2017, so they're not changing the rules for any of the current students. This year's 8th grade class will be the first at Wilson with no valedictorian. There are some other schools around that don't do it as well. It's, it's a big so change, think, though, for them. Well, they, they didn't take it lightly. They, but will they try this, and if they get a lot of people saying, no, 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 we want this back, the valedictorians, will they re go no, back think, and reconsider? No, I think this is This is, this the is a plan. done deal? It will be the Latin honor system instead. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. You know what I think about that. All right. It's, it's called, a lot of, a lot it was just a big competition in our yeah, school when I was a kid. Yeah, they don't want competition in the schools. Oh, they're going to the same system that they use to honor uh, college students. They're not in college. And that system, to be honest with you, doesn't mean very much. But more importantly, you want to kill competition. It no longer means anything to be the best it's more important to be one of the best with the idea that they're competing with... Uh, no. Guys, let's talk about how America works. Um, in spite of its major problems, and it has major problems right now, uh, football, at least, well, professional and college, is still the most popular sport in America. And we went away from the honoring everybody vagueness of just having coaches and sports writers vote for who was the best college team in the land. And they said, you know what, that's not good enough. We're going to settle it on the field. We're going to have a standard. And that standard is going to be there's still some of that vagueness. And they've turned it over to a computer. Uh, program to determine who are the best four teams in the country and then the best four teams get into a tournament single game elimination and whoever wins the last game is the champion the best in college football in America the professional football league in America, the NFL, does the same thing. We play a regular season. We determine from that who are the better teams according to whatever standard that is. And then there is a postseason tournament, single elimination. At the end, there is one champion. We do the same thing with baseball. We do the same thing with basketball. We do the same thing with soccer, which is still not that popular in this country, although I guess you could say it's growing. America is about competition. America is about the effort, successful or otherwise, to be the best with the full knowledge that only one can be. And this is this little effort that's going on to kill competition. It's going on for, been going on for a while. I remember it first surfacing with the idea of there were participation trophies, not accomplishment trophies. Well, just because you were out there, that meant you... This feminized thinking, and I'm sorry, but that's exactly what it is. This is the way females think. This is not the thinking of an empire. This is not the thinking of any society that has ever achieved greatness. You accept the idea that there is a best and that someone will be it. Whether or not it's you, totally different discussion. To get away from that 
is the, well, mama loves everybody. We're not talking about whether or not you like everybody. We're talking about whether or not they are performing. And as I said, this has been going on for quite some time. Back in 2014, now you, that report I just played came from 2013. In 2014, you could see in the Boston Globe the, the trouble with high school valedictorian awards. A high school valedictorian's mom on why it's time to end class rankings. Seriously? Wasn't the father talking about this? I find that kind of interesting. Another acculturated.com was talking about why high schools are getting rid of valedictorians. And that report was coming out in 2016. And it said, according to a recent article in the Washington Post, American students today are unmotivated and apathetic about their schoolwork, and teachers actually care more about the students' grades than the students' stop. School is not about the student. Education is not about the student. Education is about accomplishment. Education is about making sure that you demonstrate knowledge of something you did not demonstrate knowledge of before. That is accomplishment. It's not about how you feel. So when you start taking the emphasis off of their accomplishment, which is their grades, and putting it upon something as nebulous as the student, what the heck does that mean? What does that even mean, caring about the student? Well, it means I care how they feel. Feelings didn't build the Roman Empire. Feelings didn't build the Prussian Empire. Feelings didn't build anything that people have appreciated, needed, or even desired. Somebody set a goal and accomplished something. That's how it works unmotivated because you've taken away from them a prize to pursue. Even the Olympics, everybody can run, but only three make the podium and only one stands the highest. Under this current trend, well, let's give everybody a trophy and just say that one group was a little bit better than the other, but we can't have a ranking. Competition is what drives accomplishment in human beings. To take that out? Wow. Fox News opinion, this from September of 2016. Unhealthy competition. Valedictorians so scary that school may stop honoring them. Successful people in high school are so scary that the administrations can't really? The Fincastle Herald from April of this year. School board adopts recommendations to eliminate valedictorian and salutatorian awards with the class of 2021. This has been going on for a very long time. If you do not understand what this is about, this is about changing Americanism. Americanism is a highly competitive ethic and ideology. It is, it is not lacking compassion, but it does highly value accomplishment. It does highly honor those who are risk takers, who are willing to do what is necessary to achieve, even though it requires sacrifice and accomplishment always requires sacrifice. They're coming for you. Now they're also finding a way to put this together with their other factionalization effort and therefore also damage the American ethic. Daily Caller on October 5th, UC Berkeley students protest exam accused peers and professor of supporting white privilege. Let me 
break this down real quick. Midterm exam at UC Berkeley and a bunch of Hispanic students or Latin heritage students refuse to take a midterm exam because it is being given by a white professor. I'm not kidding. UC Berkeley students from the article attempted to shut down their midterm exam with claims that it would have a negative impact on their physical and mental health taking a test. The students who were captured on video demanded a take-home essay with significant time to prepare and accused their uncooperative professor of not checking his white privilege. You see how this kind of gets together? When the time to compete is there, we don't want to compete. We don't want the pressure. And instead of stepping up and performing, we will accuse you of oppression. That's not how America works. And the idea that they would be able to get away with this, of course, it's Berkeley. Berkeley's been a problem. You know what? If Berkeley were raised, R-A-Z-E-D, if Berkeley were scraped off of that plot of land where it is and never rebuilt, America would not suffer harm. So we, we kill competition among the young people so that when the time comes for them to compete, when they're older, they have no experience with it. They're not used to it. They, they believe in this group thing. Group thing is not Americanism. Americanism, America was founded on individual liberty, not group comfort. And now we have this insistence on a surreal factionalization. If you don't honor my feelings, then you're oppressing me. And it's based on whatever I come up with. Oh, I have a different skin color than you. And you're in a position where you're asking me to do something. Obviously, you are trying to oppress me with your privilege of being a different. Really? This is lunacy. But it is in your schools. It is in your high schools. It is in your schools, your colleges, your universities. It is throughout because you did not stand up and oppose this foolishness beginning back in the 1960s with Madeline Murray O'Hare. You allowed somebody to throw God out. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry for those who don't get it. The God of Israel has no problem with competition. He has no problem with competition. He has no problem with acknowledging those who are better than others. None whatsoever. He has love for those who accomplish. He has respect for those who sacrifice so that they might do. But that is against progressivism. No competition. Continuous factionalization. So you want to reverse the whole idea of a melting pot where the whole basis for society is a set of values that everyone can strive to live by and which embodies a competitive spirit that allows people to achieve without regard to race, sex, creed, national origin, or anything else that has nothing to do with accomplishment. You want to get rid of that. And you want to make sure that everybody is put into a group and we just have to honor the group. This bovine excrement version of diversity is not how America works. America is not about diversity. It is about achievement. It is about excellence. And that is the driver for diversity. Let whoever is excellent step forward. And we don't care who or what you are in terms of things that don't, that don't affect accomplishment. 
Diversity says we don't care about accomplishment. We care about who's achieving. And if we don't have the right mix of achievers, then obviously we have the wrong system. And that's why the Trump administration had to consider filing suit on behalf of Asian American students because they're being discriminated against on college admissions. They were the best qualified based on things you could measure and standards like grades. But they were being passed over for admission so that we could have quote unquote diversity. That's not diversity. That is simply dumbing down America at the institutes of higher learning. No valedictorians, no winners. I can't take a test from you if I don't think you are going to respect my feelings. No melting pot. So we're seeking feelings over accomplishments and comfort over achievement. This is nothing more than an effort to change the American ethic and it cannot do the country any good whatsoever. You need to stand against it. Part of making America great again is renewing competition within her borders. In schools, on fields of play, wherever someone can be best, then allow the effort for those to determine who is best to continue and encourage it. Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking, we'll be back right after this. Stanley Levy, Black Man Thinking, here on the dominant force in Internet conservatism, TalkAmericaRadio.com. Also, WDDQ, Talk 92.1 FM in Valdosta, Georgia. WJHC, Talk 107.5 in North Florida. Freedom in America Radio.com And WLBB, News Talk, AM 1330 in Carrollton, Georgia. Final segment of the show. I am struck by all this concern about taking a knee in the NFL when the only thing you can do still in Chicago is take cover. So for all the black people, primarily left-leaning, who are so concerned about First Amendment rights at a football game being expressed by millionaires in disrespecting the American nation, its flag and anthem, and that is what they're doing. It doesn't matter what you think about it. Well, I'm protesting for this. You know what? When your protest doesn't go over the way you want it to, you don't get to define it anymore. People understood what the Civil Rights Movement was about because the purpose was clear. They knew exactly what they were doing. They knew exactly what they were presenting. And no one was able to successfully, quote unquote, misconstrue it because they were very clear about their aims, they were very clear about what they were protesting, the evidence was very clear. This take the knee nonsense is a bunch of bull. Well, police brutality is a problem. 1.5% of all police interaction with the public involves either the threat or use of force. You wanted to, and that's been the case since the 1990s, at least 1999. You want to tell me that one and a half percent where violence is either threatened or used is a police brutality epidemic? Get out of here with that foolishness. You want to tell me that you're oppressed as a black man in the United States when you when you walked away from a fourteen and a half million dollar contract to play a game? Get out of here with that foolishness. And all the rest of you want to lock arms and talk about the oppression that you're not feeling and you can't even see unless you basically are getting a live feed of CNN straight into your cerebellum. Get out of here with that foolishness. You want to talk to me about Michael Bennett who ran from the police in Las Vegas and then lied through his teeth about them harassing him and targeting them him and putting a gun to his head get out of here with that foolishness and while you want to perpetuate that nonsense 762 people mostly black got shot and killed in Chicago 
They're up over 500 this year. Year's not over. I want to know, and the current president, while he was a candidate, actually spoke about what was going on in Chicago from the violence standpoint. The Democrat candidate never said a word because progressives never talk about their obvious problems. They would rather focus attention elsewhere. But CNN, of all people, filed a report back at the beginning of this year to talk about what had happened in Chicago with respect to homicides in 2016. I knew there was a gunshot because when I hear a lot, I, I know it wasn't firecrackers, and that's why I know it was like gunshots. Etyra Ruffin was sitting on her dad's lap on her grandma's front porch when all hell broke loose this summer. The 10-year-old says her dad used his body to shield her from the flying bullets. I heard like a, a lot, a lot of like bone and stuff. I saw all of blood over his shirt, so I thought I wanted to see him again. Her downstairs neighbor, Devin Henderson, was playing video games by a window. When I heard the gunshot, I got on the floor. My mom grabbed me. She put me in the room so to hide me. Etyra and Devin were lucky to survive the hail of bullets, but so many children are not. CNN analyzed the police crime data. One child is killed in Chicago every week on average. That's a figure that's been true for the past quarter century. Why is Chicago so deadly? Officers are under attack. In an interview with 60 Minutes, former Chicago Police Superintendent Gary McCarthy says Chicago cops are not actively policing out of fear of putting themselves and their families in jeopardy. Police are on their heels. They're on their heels for a number of reasons. We see the results, don't we? We're reaching a state of lawlessness. Of the 762 murders in 2016, 65% of the killings are happening in five districts on the south and west sides of the city, where 59 rival gangs fight each other for territory, police say. To curb the violence, more officers are being hired and gunshot detection technology allowing a faster response is being purchased. But until the killings stop, I feel scared in Chicago. I want to move from Chicago. Children caught in the crosshairs are left dodging bullets, since the two most likely places to get shot in Chicago are the street or even the home. I feel sad and scared. I don't want to be shot. Now, about President-elect Donald Trump's tweet regarding the violence in Chicago, here is a statement from the Chicago mayor's office, uh, reading, as the president-elect knows from his conversation with the mayor, we agree the federal government has a strong role to play in public safety by funding summer jobs and prevention programming for at-risk youth, by holding the criminals who break our gun laws accountable for their crimes, by passing meaningful gun laws, and by building on the partnerships our police have with federal law enforcement we are hardened. He is taking this issue seriously and look forward to working with the new administration on these important efforts. Have you lost your freaking mind, Rahm Emanuel? Funding summer programs. Excuse me. Do you recognize what? No, actually, you do recognize you don't care. They're just killing black people. 65% of the homicides, 762 of them, which was a record in 2016, occurred in five districts which are mostly black. And easily 80% plus of homicide victims in Chicago are black. It has been that way for more than a quarter century. And summer programs, if they were the answer, then you know what? You should empty your schools of everything other than summer programs, but you didn't. If job training were the answer, you should convert your schools to simple vocational um, institutes and teach people how to go work at the next available job, but you didn't. But you want to be a sanctuary city. And there's the foolishness of California becoming a sanctuary state. There's the foolishness of California making it no longer a felony to knowingly expose someone to HIV. But I digress. 480 murders in Chicago in 2015. 
which was the most since 1997. 762, a new record in 2016. Over 500 murders in 2017. And what are black people across America all upset about? Whether or not Colin Kaepernick has a job with his half-white self in the NFL? That's your concern? Whether somebody can take a knee and, and be respected? That's your concern? There are children dodging bullets in Chicago, in Milwaukee, Miami, in Baltimore, in New York, in Boston, in Atlanta, and your concern is whether or not somebody can exercise their First Amendment right to get on their knee during the... Black people have become idiots. Idiots. You are genocidal and blind, self-genocidal and blind. You kill each other and don't want to talk about it. You kill each other in the womb and on the streets, and you want to look out the window instead of looking in the mirror when you are destroying yourselves and then wonder why you are not respected. You are not respected because you are not respectable. No respectable people launches this type of genocide against themselves and then wants to talk about somebody else doing what? Well, the police are killing us. The police are killing people who do not follow their orders. And they have been authorized to do that for longer than anyone hearing my voice has been alive. That's not a change. Well, they're killing black people. They're still killing more white folks than they do you. You commit 28% of the violent crime, and you're about 25% of those killed by the police. So guess what? You're not significant. White folks still get killed, get shot, experience police use of force more than anybody. That's because there's more of them. Yeah, but here's the point. When's the last time you saw a news story about the hundreds of white folks who get killed by the police. When, when, when's the last news story you saw about that? The issue has never been how many. The issue is how many are getting reported. Even CNN and their... Uh, acknowledge that. But you don't. You don't. So I got a hashtag for you. Take cover. Hash take cover. Every time you want to put up take a knee... Take cover in Chicago. That should be the hashtag response. It's disturbing. And it's not just limited to Chicago. I already called out the cities. This is something that should be addressed by black people. They don't want to address it. They don't want to talk about it. Because it exposes that their ideology is wrong. It exposes that their values are gone. It exposes that their idea of community is a sad joke. So they're not going to talk about this. What they're going to talk about is what happened in Tulsa in 1921, as though anybody involved in that is even still alive. Well, we have some survivors. They weren't involved. They were not involved. You're talking about people who were barely chill, who were just, who were mere children at best when that occurred. Ninety years ago. Nobody's still around from that. That's not affecting your reality. Well, well, white folks bombed America. That was terrorism, and you didn't even know about it. That's because white folks tried to hide it. They didn't know about it. You had to get to a history book. And if people were trying to hide it, how did you find it in a book? Of course, I know the saying that the best way to hide things from black folks is to put it in a book. But if they were trying to hide it, why could you find it in a history book? Why are there still videos? Why is it really? Black folks... Chicago is an open embarrassment for you. It just is. You need to do something about that. 
and quickly. Get out of being concerned about who's taking a knee and linking arms on TV for two minutes and do something about the fact that somewhere in America somebody's child of color is dodging bullets that your people are putting in the air. I'm not worried about the Las Vegas shooting. That was 59 people, and that occurs once every blue moon. Again, the numbers are staggering. 480 in 2015. This is just Chicago. 762 in 2016. And over 500 and counting in 2017. That is an embarrassment. That is a statement of black America against itself. And until you deal with that, you will never have political relevance again in this country. Until you deal with your death culture on the street and in the womb, I declare to you without any reservation, you will not be politically relevant again in this country as a people. And that's our show. God bless. God keep. Care for yourselves and your loved ones. And remember that everyone else has loved ones as well. Remember your country. Because it is still the best hope for liberty and self-determination here on the planet. And we hope to be with you next week. Until then, do. You've been listening to Black Man Thinking with your host, Stan Levy. Join Stan midnight to 2 a.m. That's late Monday night into early Tuesday morning. And find him on the web at Black Man Thinking without the G. That's blackmanthinking.com. Yeah.